Welcome to Modern Thatch Living. As you can see, it's a cold and frosty morning today. And I thought it'd be quite a good time to run through our experiences with air source heat pumps. We get a lot of questions about these. People see them outside the property and from the road, and they ask us questions about the installation costs, the running costs. And there's obviously a lot of interest out there at the minute from people who are thinking about whether they should be switching to a green system like air source heat pumps uh, and whether it's right for them. And so let's walk over and see the air source heat pumps. So you can see behind me two air source heat pumps that we installed for the property. The property has a ground floor area of 170 square metres, so it's quite large by UK standards. Now when we moved in there were two oil boilers, one for each end of the house, and there are two oil tanks to go with it. And our annual spend on heating oil was around £4,000, and this was about three years ago. So prices are likely to have increased since then. Now we felt that having the air source heat pumps where one of the oil tanks had been wasn't any worse than having a great big green metal tank at the front of the house. So the heat source pumps themselves are quite quiet. They're, the one on the left here is working at the minute. It's certainly quieter than the oil boilers that we had here before. They're also very clean. They don't smell at all, unlike the oil boilers, which, okay, they were working inefficiently, but we could smell them right down at the end of the garden. Um, and that's clearly not great. We were quite limited about what we could do here. There is no gas supplied here. So it was either oil or air source heat pumps. That was our choice. Now we were about to start a lot of building work. We've done extensive work over the last three years. A lot of the plumbing and pipe work needed to be redone. The middle section of the house was completely rebuilt. And as part of that process to comply with building control, we had to put a lot of insulation in anyway. Now there's no doubt that air source heat pumps need a very well insulated house. So if you're in a new build or you're doing extensive work on a house where you need to put a lot of insulation in, then it's a good thing. The house as it was when we first moved in would not have been a good candidate for putting air source heat pumps in. So the first stage of installing heat source pumps is to figure out what it is that you want to install. What sort of system do you want? Now, there are an ever increasing number of installers out there. Uh, there are a lot of installers switching from oil-based systems over to the renewables because that's the way business is heading these days and society wants us all to move. Now, this means there are a lot of people out there who you might think are experts and actually don't have much more experience or knowledge than you do. So I would say myself that it's a very good idea if you figure out what it is you want and then talk to contractors and find out what they would suggest and then try and decide what it is ultimately you're trying to achieve and then find a contractor who you think will deliver on that. Now there are some very good contractors out there and very experienced ones, ones that have been doing this for many years. Um, and we chose to go down the route of using one of those people. But we did get a wide range of quotes and talked to a lot of people before we made the final decision. And we got a range of views on what we needed. Um, there was there were contractors who thought we should put an uh, air source heat pump at either end of the house. There was a range of views on the sizing of the system. As the bottom end was around 8 kilowatts and the top end was around 20 kilowatts. 
that's obviously a massive range and that has an impact on the cost. And, um, and so you need to decide what it is you want uh, and what you think will work for you. Because ultimately you're going to pay for it and you're going to do it once and you don't want to be doing it again. So as you can see behind me, we chose to go with two heat source pumps, each operating uh, independently. And there's a total capacity of 24 kilowatts there. Now we can either heat the water and the heating with one, or we can heat the heating with both, or we can heat the heating with one and the water with the other which provides us with great flexibility to cope with fluctuations in the usage within the house. Heating the water separately was quite important to me. It is surprising that even with a 300 litre water tank, how a young adult can actually drain that in one shower. So, as you can see, one of the pumps at the minute is working. It's quite quiet. It's certainly quieter than an oil boiler. So in terms of the design of the system, uh, we were doing a lot of building work anyway. So where possible, we went for underfloor heating. And where that wasn't possible, we upgraded the radiators to, to ones with a larger surface area that would pack more heat out into the room. The reason for that is because the water that circulates in the system is actually at a lower temperature than you would get with an oil boiler. So the circulating water temperature is usually around 34 degrees in our system which is much much lower than from an oil fired boiler. Of a particular problem is the barn on your right and that barn is not very thermally efficient and so heating that was a particular problem for us. However the barn at the end has a wood stove and we put a new wood stove in um, that is much more efficient than the one that was in there before. Unfortunately for us, we have quite a lot of trees on this property and supply of wood through the general maintenance of the trees on the site is actually pretty good. And so we're not going to have to buy wood to heat uh, the side of barn. Right, we're in the utility room now to show you the side of heat source pumps that nobody really talks about. There is an awful lot of plumbing that goes with this system. Now, it is a little bit more complex than usual because we do have two heat pumps so that we can heat the water or have the heating going independently of each other or supply extra heat to one or the other if we need it. We essentially have two out feeds and two in feeds into the system over here. Then there are a set of valves and pumps so that you can either heat the water in this tank. This is a 300 litre tank. It does have an immersion heater in as well. And there's a buffer tank here. So this is to smooth out variations in the temperature of the heating water in the house. The water typically is maintained at about 52 degrees in the system and it is programmed so that the immersion heater comes on every couple of weeks to basically purify the system, kill off any bacterial growths that might be in there. Uh, the worry is Legionella growth if the water is below 60 degrees. Up here again it is a bit more complex, perhaps, depending on the system that you have. We've got feeds for underfloor, feeds for underfloor heating, feeds for the radiators, hot water feed, cold water feed, and a loop for the hot water. So because the house is very long, we actually have a loop that runs down to the other end of the house and back to allow hot water on demand. Um, it, we actually don't, we actually find that it is not really necessary. There's something a bit funny about the system that we've got. It can actually take longer to get hot water in the kitchen, which is just next door, 
than to get hot water at the other end of the house. And I don't really understand that. But anyway, that's what it is. And we've got two header tanks, um, basically expansion tanks, the, the buffer tank and the hot water. Up here we've got the control unit, which I'll show you now. So here we've got the outside temperature at three degrees, the internal temperature at 20 degrees. Now the internal thermostat doesn't actually do very much on this system as it's set up. The water temperature is currently 52 degrees and it's actually heating at the minute. And here we've got the flow out to the heat source pumps at 34 degrees and the flow, the return flow, which is at 39 degrees. So the heat source pumps are currently working. If we open up the control panel, a range of options open and you can alter the water temperature. You can schedule it to heat warmer at some times of the day than others. And there's also a section for programming things like the return loop and how often it goes through the Legionella uh, hygiene cycle. In terms of the climate control, there is a option for altering the temperature within the house. Now that's done through this number here and it actually offsets a predictive curve that you can see elsewhere in the unit, which I'll show you now. Here we've got the curve function. If we open it up, we can see a predictive curve. Along the bottom is the temperature outside and it runs from plus 30 degrees to minus 40 and clearly in the UK we're never going to get to minus 40 unless something really extraordinary happens and on the y-axis we've got the return flow temperature so as an example here if it's two degrees outside then the predicted flow temperature that's needed for this house is 31 degrees now what this is doing is it's allowing the system to compensate for the heat losses and the thermal efficiency of the house with the required temperature that you want and the external temperature. And on the basis of that calculation, it predicts what the flow temperature needs to be to heat the house. So this is the main living area of the house and one design feature here is to have a lot of glass on this side of the room. Now that's because it faces eastwards and in the early morning throughout to about midday we get an awful lot of sunshine through here and this has a massive effect of warming this room and it's a very large open plan room this. Most of the house is zoned into relatively small areas um, and that allows us to shut off parts of the house that we're not using. And I think that's very important in its own right for the efficiency of the system. The rooms upstairs are extremely well insulated and honestly if you've got somebody sitting or working in a room upstairs with a computer on, there's more heat generated than you actually need to keep the room warm. So in those rooms, generally the underfloor heating is turned off when there's somebody in there because it just keeps them, the, the insulation is just so effective. Downstairs, there's much more of an issue because we've got doors and that get opened to the outside. And so there is much more of a cooling effect. As I said, the house is zoned throughout uh, and that helps us to control the energy usage of the system. In this room, we've got underfloor heating throughout um, and it's really, really nice to have that. So what about the costs? Well, 
we were doing a lot of work anyway. We were putting in a lot of insulation into the house. We were redoing a lot of the plumbing. So if you look at the calculation of replacing the oil boilers with air source heat pumps, then based on the savings that we're making each year, after having done that, we will recover the cost of that installation in about four years. However, if you take into account the cost of all the insulation we had to put in, redoing the radiators, putting in a whole load of underfloor heating, zoning the house to make this a really efficient system, then the time to recover the cost of doing all of that work is between 16 and 20 years based on the current price of oil. Now obviously that will reduce if the price of oil goes up in the future, which it probably will. But as you can see, it's still quite a difficult calculation to make when you're deciding to do this for yourself, if you're not planning to do a lot of other work as well. If you've got a modern house that's well insulated, then air source heat pumps will probably work well for you. If you've got an old house and you're planning to put a lot of insulation in and you don't mind upgrading the radiators, then again, air source heat pumps will probably work for you. If you've got an old thermally inefficient house and you don't really want to put the money into the insulation and you don't really want to replace all your radiators, then I would say this is not the system for you. You have to be prepared to do all these other things to actually make the system work. And what about future plans? Well, it would be really lovely to put solar panels in the field that we've got at the back here. Uh, then hopefully we could provide all the electricity that we need to drive the heat source pumps. And that would be ideal. Whether we'll get to that point, I don't know. It's very difficult to tell how things are going to go from here. We have put in ductwork underneath the grass here so that we can get electricity supply into the house from the field in the future if we choose to go down that route very easily. Anyway, I hope that you've enjoyed this review of air source heat pumps and how we've gone about installing them in our property and I hope that you've found it interesting. And I look forward to seeing you next time. Goodbye.